Hey, what is up guys? Lord Nick here bringing you another episode of the Dangerous Game Podcast. I got hit up in my Discord about why I hadn't been releasing one. Um, and to be honest, I just didn't have a whole lot that I really felt like talking about um, that really fit into the podcast format. I generally had been trying to move the podcast to having a co-host every every time I wanted to do something. So I could bounce ideas off someone. The person I was doing it with, Sark, while somewhat entertaining, also just kind of stopped having ideas and I haven't talked to him for a while. So, I mean, it, it ultimately just kind of came down to there wasn't a whole point to having somebody else on here. So I had to kind of devise my own plan as to what I wanted to talk about that I couldn't do in a different formatted video. Be it another guide or another kind of talk about how to do things type of video. So predominantly, I kind of wanted to talk about the preseason 11. A lot of people have not been enjoying this preseason. It has been um, arguably a very controversial one as to if people like it or not because tank meta is kind of back. Um, and a big part of that is just to the fact that tank items were very overtuned. Um, and it, it made sense that tank items were so far overtuned. Tanks have predominantly been in a weak spot for quite a while now. You know, exceptions being to a handful of tanks that had the ability to hyperscale, or uh, if the enemy decided to devise a stupid composition that could be easily countered by a hyper tank. There's very limited reasons to actively have a tank in the game previously, and so I think Riot tried to overtune it to try to get them back in the meta. That being said, they gave them way too much damage on one specific item, and their other two items were good, but not really, like, god-tier in any way, shape, or form. So I think some of the things that Riot should do, instead of focusing on, um, in terms of repairing the tank class should be adding a more bit of balance across the board. I get it, Sunfire Aegis is supposed to be kind of their damage option in terms of a tank option, and kind of the odd bottle piece about it that I don't like is that it gives such a static number across the board of armor and MR. Both of the other items specifically give either more armor or more MR in comparison. And I think that they need to be changed so that they're all roughly built out of Aegis. I know it doesn't make as much sense for that. But hear me out, my biggest reason for that is just due to the fact that I feel like the situations that you'd want to build those other items doesn't always necessarily give you the, it doesn't give you the stats that you want the active for. The other the other two have really good, you know, passive slash actives, but there's more situational as to like, okay, well one of them gives you a ton of MR and it kind of mimics Merc treads. But the problem is, is usually when you want to go, you know, you know, you want to go for that item to go in, it's not always because they have a lot of AP. And so, yeah, while it's great to get that active soon, it sometimes actually becomes more detrimental to the tank to go that item first, just because you don't have enough armor to survive going in, which is actually kind of annoying. Um, likewise, I have similar issues with Frostfire giving me too much armor in a situation where sometimes I need to just be able to peel off just high you know, high bursty mages that are trying to, you know, do combos and stuff. Um, it, it's kind of a small argue point, and it's not something that, like, terribly needs revision, but I think it just make more sense to make them all build out of Aegis, opposed to just having a specialization of it, because it just feels weird and it feels odd. Because uh, neither of those items specifically say that they synergize one way or the other. I mean, if anything, I thought that the going it ability would actually synergize more with more armor, and it would make sense in terms of an item to do more armor than MR, just because when you're charging at people like that, generally you're charging ADCs and stuff, and thus just makes more sense. On top of that, the AP items had just gotten nerfed quite a bit, so the MR is cool, but it's not like really needed now, because most of the mages are more or less in a balanced spot. Um, but I feel like that this season is very controversial because of the fact that we have blatantly overpowered items, um, and that's kind of the point, and it's an interesting concept because I'd been kind of arguing for a while that they really, to balance League of Legends, the best thing you do is make everybody quote-unquote OP, and then nobody's OP, right? Like, that's just a concept there. If there's somebody underpowered, then it's just tweaking them up. Um, and I feel like this is kind of a better philosophy, is adding more buffs opposed to nerfs, just due to the fact that the more nerfs you apply, the more difficult it's going to be to introduce stronger things in the future um and this all really kind of stemmed down from a uh video i watched from gbay 99 
where he expresses, you know, certainly T, a very controversial champion designer's opinions about how to build champions and such of the like. And a lot of people look at it and they kind of don't like it nonetheless. It doesn't matter how well explained it gets, they really don't like certainly T's champion designs because he has introduced a lot of very broken and a lot of unfun to play against champions. That being said, they're extremely fun to play. But I think part of them stop being unfun to play against once you learn they have counterplay. Aphelios is extremely easy to play into as long as you know, you know, the fact now, you know, there's been a lot of nerfs now, which makes him a lot easier to play into. But even when he was overpowered, there were specific things he was good at and there were specific things he was too good at. And yes, he deserved the nerfs, but I don't think he deserved all of the nerfs to where he got gutted the way he did. Um, now... If you take a look at it, though, if you don't have somebody pushing that boundary, somebody doing that constantly, we're going to end up with stale champion design, kind of like what we ended up with in Season 2. A lot of people like to argue Season 3 was like the golden age of League of Legends, but to be honest, prior to certainly T creating Darius, a lot of champions followed the same principle, and Bay explains it a lot better than I could, so I would recommend going and watching this video that he does about it where it kind of explains what the problem Riot was starting to face in champion design and why they went to somebody like Certainly T to build them. He's a brand new guy, he had no experience, and he had an outward opinion about how he thinks the game should have been balanced. And the idea is to institute fun for the person you're designing the champion for, not necessarily who he's playing against. <laughs> that being said, the design of the champion should have some weak points so that it can be exploited. Darius was very kiteable. You know, while well, people could argue, oh, he's not that kiteable, he, he's pretty easy to outrun as long as you position properly and you're not stupid. You know, going all in and trying to fight front up on a Darius, you know, being right on top of him just means you're probably going to die. He's really good at that style of fighting. Dogpiling on top of him, again, means you're probably going to die. He's really good at that fighting, unless you have a lot of CC to dogpile him, and then you could do that. But if you have limited CC and you don't have a lot of range, well, you've kind of drafted yourself into a situation where Darius thrives. You know, it's not the champion's fault that you chose bad choices. And I think that's a big, big thing that Season 11 is going to reveal for a lot of people and why it's probably going to be the least popular um, season we've had in a while for a lot of people isn't necessarily because it's going to be focused around how mechanically skilled are you at outplaying your opponents, but it's about how well are you at making decisions. Think about it, that's the whole point of this item rework, is to make you have to think, to make you have to make decisions, make you have to choose what's the better option for this game, what is the better, you know, mythic that I have to go with just based off of my team composition and based off the enemy composition. You know, what is the best build path that I can go based off of how this game is going? Am I fed enough that I can continue on a carry build? Do I need to go towards a kind of bruisery build? Do I need to go into a tank build? You know, you're going to be given so many different options on to how you should try to play the game. Um, and it ultimately comes down to your decision making that's going to make it if this game goes well or not. You can make a lot more comebacks this season so far. Even in the preseason, I've already had a lot of games where it's like, oh, it looks like we've lost this one. Enemy team has 13 some odd kills up on us. And then all of a sudden we're making a comeback because we just decided to itemize a certain way. And they're just doing their general itemization. So the idea of general itemization is gone. There's not going to be just a one set build path that's going to be the best path every single game, which is why my previous guide video got some somewhat mixed reviews from certain people. A lot of people really liked my Trundle guide video, but a big philosophy that I tried to put into it for people is that there's not going to be just one path. You're going to have to figure out how to adjust game by game by game. And the people who are more intellectual, people that like to think, that like to theorycraft, kind of like myself, are going to thrive in the system like this a little bit better than the people that are just going the same build every time. If you want to build the same thing every single time, go over to freaking playing ARAMs, dudes. Try out normals, for instance. Ranked is going to be divided because there's going to be a lot of mechanical skilled people that are not going to be able to climb as well because they don't think about their build path as much. Now there are going to be one tricks who are mechanically skilled and know everything about their champion in and out more so than just the mechanics of their champion that they're going to be able to devise these build paths and are becoming going to become stronger. So there are going to be some cases of the mechanics going to outweigh some of the thinking process. You know, people who have a raw mechanical skill on one champion to the point that they are in the top percent of their champion are going to climb just so much easier here because they should be able to adapt to learning on how to adapt your build path because you only have to focus on one champion. 
So the idea that having a three champion pool is going to become much more important. You know, these fundamentals that people have been trying to grind into people's minds for the past couple of years are going to become even more and more important this season. Um, you're going to have to focus on a select group of champions. You're going to have to focus on a select different couple of builds for these champions. So having a three champion pool is going to be a much, much bigger thing than it has been in previous seasons. Playing 30 some odd champions, of which you're not great at any of them and you're kind of neutral on all of them, is going to make it where you're going to stagnate a lot harder. So people like me who like doing that are going to have to adjust to playing just a handful of champions, which I can do. I can play three to four champions and just kind of stick with those three to four for a while. Um, so you're going to have to look at that. You're going to have to look at more of your team composition a little bit more. And you're going to have to go back to learning how to counter pick a little bit more. This is a skill I think has fundamentally fallen out of League of Legends popularity and has fallen out of a lot of people's mindset is learning how to counterpick. I remember back in season two, season three, it was all about who could counterpick who the best. And as the seasons progressed, it wasn't necessarily about counterpicking. It was about not picking dog grab champions, just picking out who's the top of the meta, who's the broken in the top of the meta. And the skill of counterpicking, picking somebody who just divisively does things that stops the other person's game plan it's kind of been forgotten almost to a degree you know there's some of it in pro play and organized play but in solo queue you just don't see it very often um so i think building a kind of semi-diverse pool of champions who play very similar in terms of role wise you know maybe you play three different tanks but each of those tanks functionality is different you know skarner a sejuani and let's go with nunu uh, all three of these champions play a different role in the teams. Nunu is big about the objective controls and making a zone of influence that is very hard to get into. He can be very yeah, appeal for his team, and he can chase down somebody on your team pretty easily. Uh, meanwhile, somebody on Sejuani is looking to make big engages and big team fight plays and work around her team to constructively fight for objectives before they come up to then be able to secure them. Nunu can look for steals or try to solo secure as his team's doing fights and stuff. Nunu has a lot more options in that regard than her, but she has a lot better chances of getting a stronger full-on engage on um, and still doing a disgusting amount of damage in the process. Meanwhile, you look at Skarner, and he's much more of a skirmishy type of person who's looking also for pick potential. Uh, he doesn't necessarily want to take full five on five fights while well, he's not terrible at it because he has a massive AoE and he has a stun that he can lock on to multiple people and he can pick a specific target and drag him out of a fight. He likes to find those people that are going out for war. He likes to find people that stuff. Uh, you know, if they get caught and they can just instantly get blown up by him. So stylistically, these three champions are very different. Though their role rel is all relegated to tank, they play different roles, and thus they're going to be better against certain champions. Skarner is going to be really good at locking down those Master Yis, those Kha'Zixes, those champions that want to go to the back line and pop off. Well, you know, unless they get QSSs going, Skarner's just not going to care, and he's going to just drag you to your death. And uh, meanwhile, Sejuani is going to try to instigate onto your face and threaten whoever she hits. It could be a tank, it could be a squishy. She's still going to do a lot of damage to them. And she's going to be very beefy to start because of her passive. She's all about forcing a giant fight and making you have to focus her. You know, and then you have somebody like Nunu who's very good at objective and zone control. So you have these different style of champions. You have different ideas. Even though they're, some, they're of the same class, they're each going to have their independent roles that you're going to choose each one for. And if you pick these three as like your main champions, all three are actually pretty good right now which means all three are also going to excel at helping you climb and allowing you to kind of make an option against your opponents. Each one can itemize separately, have different builds that each one can do that would help them adjust to a situation if you were to one trick them. But it might be easier to just be able to have like, oh, you know what? I, I use this one for this type of fighting, you know? And also each one is stronger at different points in the game. Sejuani is a really good early ganker. Nunu is a really, is an obscenely good early ganker. Skarner, not so much. Sejuani's okay at early skirmishes, but excels better in the mid game for team fights. Skarner is pretty solid at early skirmishes. Even if you start losing, you're just super fast. You can run away. And is super strong in mid game skirmishes and objective control fights. Nunu, somewhat of a similar idea, but he's also better in extended fights that go longer because he heals himself and adds a lot more CC. So 
you know, he kind of wants the fight to carry on faster. Skarner wants to make an immediate pick, get the kill, and move to the next thing. Sejuani kind of wants to make a big, giant, you know, grouped up, you know, mosh pit of an ARAM fight. So you're going to have differences in how you play them. They're going to have different spots in the game that they're going to get stronger. And these are things you're going to have to analyze as a player. And you're going to have to come to terms with as the season goes on. It's no longer I'm mechanically a god at this champion. But, you know, I just have to get fed and snowball. While that is still an aspect of the game, snowballing is harder than anything right now. I think a big part of it comes down to also, you know, how well do you itemize? If you can itemize to counter how the enemy is snowballing, who is snowballing on the enemy team, so that they can't just immediately one-shot you, I think you stand a better chance to potentially win, you know? You have something like Arm Guard for mages that keeps them alive. ADCs have some options for some armor items as well, be it in uh, Guardian Angel uh, or the anti-burst items in terms of the fact that they can now build Steric's Gauge if they're really behind. That gives you a lot of damage and it gives you this giant shield that allows you to also heal as you hit people. Like, there's items you can build that are much more versatile than that and people just have to think outside of the box slightly on how to do it. The, the the scapegoat I think that everybody falls to is what do the pros play, what do the pros say to do, what do they do, and they just kind of fall that path. I think you also have to kind of adjust to what your play style is, and it's going to be better in terms of analyzing how you want to play the game, and then figuring out what items suit well to how you want to play the game, and then being able to say, well, I'm being denied how I want to play the game here, do I have a fallback plan? So there's a lot of different things you can do to prep for the season. And I think this season's going to be a lot of fun if you have the ability to think cognitively and kind of adjust and improve. Um, and it's going to be much more of a mental challenge, more so than a raw, just skill challenge even. You know, there are going to be picks that are OP because there's always picks that are OP. And if you don't feel like playing them, that's fine. Ban them and pick something else that you like to play. But just be wary that you also have chances for opponents to counterpick you, and likewise, you have chances to counterpick them. So just kind of use your mind, be a little bit smarter about it, and the season should be a lot of fun for you. Uh, I know this is kind of a short one in, in terms of podcast. It's only about 17 minutes long, um, and I wanted to talk about more, but I don't really have much more to talk about at this point. It's going to be kind of a short episode. I do intend, like I say at the end of every video, to continue making more podcasts, more insightful videos, and more things for people to into in the background so that they don't stare at my ugly mug um but uh i don't know to be honest i want to be saying that i'm going to try to get one done here in a couple weeks um uh, I, I guess i'll take this time that usually spent with other stuff to kind of give you guys some updates on stuff that's going on so for many of you who might have heard in some of my previous videos i have been attempting to get into collegiate league of legends um and Successfully so, I actually made it onto the University of Northern Michigan University's team. Um, unfortunately, there was a lot of things that I was promised about with this team um, that just didn't come through through the fall. And it was supposedly going to get better. Don't worry, it's going to get better. Uh, but with corona and everything going on, it just didn't make sense for me to try to move all the way across the country away from my family uh, into a climate I didn't really want to be in. And that's actual environmental climate i don't like the cold so moving up to northern michigan was just not a really great plan in that regard and then on top of that there was issues with the school in terms of scholarships not being funded to players the arena they were building wasn't going to be operational and the fact that the campus was probably going to be closed so there was no point to me moving up there to begin with um and it just a lot of problems occurred within the team that i'm going to keep to myself a bit i've only shared with some of my friends uh, so it ultimately just kind of comes down to that there was a lot of things that I thought it was going to be and it just turned, didn't turn out to be that. So I ended up leaving that team. I have tryouts for another team here in San Antonio. It's called St. Mary's University, uh, a private Catholic university. It's a bit expensive, but uh, I'm going to do tryouts with them coming up uh, in January. Um, but I ultimately am probably not going to their school this coming semester. It is very expensive, so I'm going to take this next semester to work at a community college to increase my uh, GPA so that I qualify for better scholarships come the fall. Um, and then lastly, I have joined an amateur team for a casual esports amateur league. Uh, they're just kind of a casual, as their name says, casual amateur scene. Uh, for league of legends tournaments they only do rp prizing and stuff which is kind of dope and it was a cheap entry so i'm going to do it for the one season and uh 
see how it goes and then i'm going to potentially look for more amateur teams until the fall um and just kind of go from there um but that's kind of how things are going with me right now uh, i am unemployed uh still uh, actively for jobs still so i still have a lot of time which means i should be streaming more but i'm not uh i just hadn't really been motivated to so i think uh though starting here after christmas i intend to start trying to build out a stream schedule for myself uh be it for just league of legends or a stream schedule that involves other variety games or even just me uh, i'm working a lot on a uh, custom system similar to dungeons and dragons to be a tabletop rpg uh, so maybe I'll be working on that on stream, who knows. Uh, and I'm going to try to make a video schedule, maybe. Uh, kind of set up, maybe maybe the weekly podcast won't be returning, probably won't be returning uh, in the immediate future. Um, because I do want to make a slight change to the podcast. I want, it's going to stay the Dangerous Game podcast, but I want to change it to having um, aspects that, ha that I hadn't had really before. I want to try to get guests, you know, be it small-time pros or high-level ELO players that don't really get to talk about stuff to other you know, kind of get other people's points on stuff and start trying trying to come up with a generalized topic for the podcast and direction for it so it might go on a bit more of a hiatus again it might be another couple months before an episode starts but once I have a new style for the episodes how I have an, a, a picture for them I think I'm going to actively going to be producing them with similar length and within a set schedule for them as well um, and then likewise, I'm going to try to start scheduling ideas for YouTube videos. I have a couple of different genres of videos that I've done in the past that I'll probably try to pick up again. Um, and I hope this updates, you know, a little bit in, uh, insightful into what I'm hoping to do. Uh, ultimately also, if I get a job, that's going to change some of these plans because I'll be doing full-time school, part-time jobs. So the hobby might get put on the back burner if, uh, all these things come to so um hopefully though i can get kind of i can hopefully get this going a little bit more a little bit faster and a little bit more consistently um but god only knows if i'll be able to keep up on that but i appreciate every single one of you for stopping by for watching for listening to these videos and i hope to see you guys in the next video please make sure to like subscribe share it with friends and leave comments down below and uh, you all have yourselves a wonderful wonderful day